no better person to talk about sheep economics is uh, Peter Aimer. Um, since joining um, Abacus in 2001, Peter has focused his strengths on delivering high quality statistical, genetic and economic analysis and strategy to breeding programs across a wide range of farm species, both domestically and internationally. Uh, an expert on global beef, sheep and dairy breeding, uh, Peter has extensive input into the, the, the development of economic indexes for beef, dairy and sheep for both industries around the world and the, the commercialisation of new uh, genomic and genetic technologies. Thank you, Peter. Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, hopefully I won't take too long. Uh, Graham mentioned at the start this, uh, the byline genetics for profit and John and Michael have mentioned the, the importance of driving down the costs of these new technologies. So, you know, this whole economics side of things is, is very relevant uh, to the program, making sure that, that, that both com commercial farmers and breeders get value for money. So, um, just to sort of highlight a couple of areas where we plan to focus on in terms of economics, and uh, this area is actually uh, led more by Tim Byrne, who happens to be away overseas at the moment, so I'm, I'm stepping in for him. Um, so one, one thing that we plan to do is review the SIL indexes. So a, a key factor that Michael raised is this idea of the, um, the sheep industry uh, becoming more predominant or, or a great, more greatly represented in, in the hill country. So we need to look at the indexes. What needs to be different if we were to focus more on hill country? Um, accounting for... Uh, breed shifts or genetic gain, so as we increase, have, has increased the prolificacy uh, over time and made the sheep bigger, you know, have we effectively mined out the genetic progress that we can make in those traits and do we have to sh start shifting emphasis onto other traits? Uh, things are changing all the time in the world of prices and costs and competing industries in New Zealand, so uh, one, one of the, the key factors going into the SIL uh, indexes is, is, is uh, economic predictions from the Meat and Wool Service, or sorry, the, I've just got a new name now, but that's probably about three names ago, uh, the Beef and Lamb um, Economic Service. Uh, so, so just making sure that we're up to date with the latest prices and, and, and also predictions that they provide of what's going to happen in the future. Also, if, as we bring new traits into, into the genetic evaluation system, we need to work out, well, how much emphasis should go on those traits uh, versus the traits that are there existing in the indexes and examples of new longevity uh, body condition score. So um, there's a, a, another sort of series of projects that I can put up for examples. So one is the... Um, the idea of you weight where uh, we don't want them to get smaller, uh, but we don't really want extremely large ewes, and, and how do we balance this in an index, and should we be, we be looking at some sort of non-linear weighting on, on mature size or some sort of restriction uh, so that it, we don't finish up farming uh, elephants in, in 20 years' time. Uh, also the idea of using information uh, to help commercial farmers with culling decisions. So the commercial use selection indexes uh, is getting, trying to get a handle on what, what, what information can be used in commercial farms or in multiplier systems to help one, that commercial farmer make better uh, U replacement decisions, what, what use to go to terminal size, and also to feed information back up into the, the, uh, the breeding sector. So again, I mentioned with the U weight, the idea of non-linear or intermediate optimums and litter size or number of lambs born is a key trait where I think many, many farmers would feel that their scanning percentages at least are getting near an optimum. <coughs> so then the, becomes the dilemma, well, do we not select high and low uh, NLB rams and just focus on the middle ground or what's an efficient way of moving overall selection forward uh, but, but not increasing the, um, the scanning percentages too much more. So those sort of issues need to be thought about. In the past we've always thought more is better 
Uh, in the future, we might have to think, how do, how do we hold on a happy medium? So then there's another area of rambit breeder business metrics. So this is a, a, a series of ideas to help ram breeders understand their business, what drives their profitability, uh, how they can get value for money in their investments, what, the, what sort of rams are being sold or under demand, uh, are in demand, uh, that, that sort of thing. So I guess um, that's a, a quick wrap of the, the sort of some of the economics projects that we have in mind. A question but a comment for both Peter and Michael. Um, is there seems to be an assumption that um, sheep are moving to harder hill country um, as a dry land, low land farmer uh, contemplating irrigation in North Canterbury. My problem is going to be, um, can I actually um, do something if I get water to put on? So don't assume that um, I will be watering and going away from sheep because at the moment there's a hell of a lot of restrictions and, and we may not actually be able to do that. And even dry land farmers to increase production are going to be hit by these um, nutrient regulations as well. So do bear that in mind and don't sort of go wholly one way without <coughs> and assume that all the flat country is going to be running cows because it's not. Okay, I, yeah, I'm uh, happy to take that uh, on board. So my feeling would be that the the easier country, for lack of a better description, is possibly well well serviced, more well serviced by the current system. There's a, there's a question, really, and it's unresolved. Do we need different kinds of sheep for the harder country? <laughs> <laughs>